I have a beautiful young audience here immediately in front of me. And I called the youngest of them to me just a few minutes ago. And I said, if you get tired, you go to sleep. That applies to the rest of you in the audience as well. <laughs> I was once talking in a church, and the baby began to cry, and the mother took the babe out. As she was going down the aisle, I said, Madam, the child is not bothering me. She said, No, you're bothering the child. <laughs> A woman bought an expensive dress, brought it home to the husband, showed him the bill, and he said to her, when you tried it on, why didn't you say, get behind me, Satan? She said, I did, and he said, it looks so good from the back. There was a man went to heaven, and he thought perhaps he would like to go to hell, see what it was like, and he asked St. Peter if he could go down. So he went down to hell and rather enjoyed himself over the weekend. Came back to heaven, and the following weekend said to Peter, Really, I, I didn't mind it down there. Could I go down again? Yes, said Peter. And for the second time, he came back and reported enjoying himself. The third time, he asked to go down, and Peter said, now this is your last time. When he got down, the devil put him in one of the hot corners of hell. And he said to the devil, when I was here before, you treated me nicely. Yes, he said, then you were a tourist, now you're a resident. <laughs> so remember, we get treated very well now by the devil, but when we're residents, he does not treat us as well. I have a missionary priest friend whom I has been my intimate for over 35 years. And he's been a missionary in China, Korea, Vietnam, has been in prison in Russia. And the last time I saw him, he told me that he went into one of the churches in Vietnam and the children were gathered around another girl who was about 10 or 12 years of age. And they pointed the girl out to him, and the girl had a veil over her face. And he pulled the veil down, and he said it was the ugliest face that he had ever seen. Not so much the face itself, physically, but the ugly features that she portrayed. He paid little attention to her, and the children came to him the next day. And then he became a bit frightened of her, and he asked if she had lived, lived in the village, and she had lived in the village just a short period of her life. He spoke French to her, she spoke perfect French. Spoke Italian, spoke Latin, though she had no training in any of these languages. And he felt then perhaps that she was possessed. And he took a relic of the little flower and brought it to her. She reacted violently. Then took the relic out and just brought the frame of the relic and she laughed at him. And then he briefly exercised her and she was perfectly normal. Now because we are so, we get so much of our theology from the press, I thought perhaps you might be interested in hearing about the devil from a sound philosophical and theological point of view. I'm going to describe to you the devil first from the psychiatric point of view. 
and secondly from the biblical. First, the psychiatric. It is interesting that as we drop things in the church, the world begins to pick them up and distorts them. Now we, for example, the nuns drop the long habits, the girls put on maxi coats. We stop saying the beads, hippies put the beads around their neck. And as theologians dropped the demonic, the psychiatrist picked it up. Rollo May of Rockefeller Institute has several chapters in his work on psychiatry on the diabolic. What is the diabolic from the purely psychiatric point of view? Dr. Rollo May analyzes the word diabolic. It comes from the Greek words dia and balain. Dia balain is to tear apart, rend asunder. Anything, therefore, that breaks pattern, that destroys unity, that corrupts gestalt, produces discord, that is the diabolic. Now, there has been a great increase of the diabolic. Notice, for example, the discord in the church. The discord in religious communities. The discord among the laity as regards the church. Discords in the clergy. All these are manifestations of a spirit of the diabolic that, is, that surrounds us. Now this psychiatrist analyzes the way in which the diabolic works. And he mentions three. First, love of nudity. Secondly, violence, aggressiveness. Thirdly, split personalities, no inner peace, disjointed minds. First, a love of nudity. I asked a chaplain some years ago in, a, in an institution if he had manifest any manifestations of the diabolic in an institution where he was and said, yes, sometimes when I bring the Blessed Sacrament in, the people strip as I pass the room. But we leave that aside. That is not important. I would rather refer you to the Gospel. Now, our Blessed Lord one time went into the land of the Gerizines or Gadarenes. It depends upon which translation of the scriptures you are using. And he found in this land a young man possessed by the devil. The gospel mentions three characteristics of this young man. First, he was nude. Secondly, he was violent and aggressive. They could not even keep him in chains. And thirdly, his mind was split, schizophrenic. Our Lord said to him, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion. Now, a legion in his time meant 6,000 soldiers in the Roman army. See already, he's a person and yet he's legion, 6,000 others. My name is Legion, for we are many. See, the personality is no longer unified. I, Legion, we, many. Now, this psychiatrist does not ever correlate his three manifestations of the diabolic 
with this young man in the gospel. I am doing that because I could not help but notice the similarity between the two. So from just a superficial point of view, the diabolic disrupts. And whenever you have a great manifestation of the Spirit, you always get the devil working. When, for example, Moses in the Old Testament worked miracles against Pharaoh, Pharaoh's agents simulated a few miracles. When the Holy Spirit came upon the early church, Pentecost, there was the persecution of Stephen. We had a Vatican Council. The blessing of the Spirit upon the church. And we have immediately the manifestation of the evil spirit. So I just leave you with this characteristic note of the diabolic from the psychiatric point of view. The breakup of unity, the breakup of families, breakup of corporations, breakup of religious communities, breakup of the oneness of Christ. That is one analysis of the demonic. The second, the biblical. I take you now to the 16th chapter of Matthew. Our blessed Lord had asked the most important question that could ever be asked. Who do men say that I am? Eventually, Peter gave the right answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then our blessed Lord announced that he was going up to Jerusalem to be delivered over to the Gentiles, to be spat upon, crucified, and eventually would rise from the dead. Peter was willing to have a divine Christ, but he was not willing to have a suffering one. And as soon as our blessed Lord said that he was going to be the victim for our sins, which I described in the last conference, as soon as our Lord said that, Peter said, this shall not be. We do not want that kind of a Christ. And our Lord turned on him and said, get behind me. Do not try to lead me. I lead you, Satan. Satan. Imagine. Peter personally is Satan. Now dwell on that. Who would think that in the course of a minute and a half he could become Satan? Why did our Lord call him Satan? Well, go back now to the beginning of our Lord's public life and I will reveal to you again the three temptations that were presented to our Lord by Satan. And we will learn from this discussion that the essence of the satanic or the diabolic is the hatred of the cross of Christ. Now, let that dwell in your minds. What is the satanic from the biblical point of view? It is the contempt of the cross of Christ. It's anti-cross. As he proved now, and that is the meaning, we go back to the temptation. Our blessed Lord is on the mountain, and Satan offers him three short, cuts from the cross. Why be a savior from sin? You want mankind to follow you? 
I will tell you the way, said Satan. You do not need a cross. I will give you three shortcuts. The first, see those stones down there? They look like little loaves of bread, don't they? You haven't eaten in 40 days. Listen, you have an id. You've got an instinct for food. Other people have got other instincts. They've got an instinct for power, an instinct for sex. Let them cover their will. Satisfy their appetites. That will win men. But forget the cross. The first shortcut, permissiveness. Do whatever you feel like doing. The second temptation, the cross will never win mankind because mankind loves wonders, surprises, the startling. The marvelous. Anything that will make them say, oh. They'll forget the marvels in a week, then repeat another marvel. Fly to the moon. Throw yourself from the steeple and be unhurt. That's a marvel. Do that and the crowds will follow you. But you need no cross. And the final temptation, which will be the temptation of the church in the next 100 years? And we have the dim beginnings of it now. Satan says theology is politics. Why bother with theology? God. The transcendent, the mystery of redemption. The only thing that matters is politics. And holding, as it were, the shiny globe of the world in his hand, Satan said, All these kingdoms are mine. Am I? And I will give them to you. And falling down, you will adore me. Was Satan for once in his life telling the truth? Are all the kingdoms his? But in any case, it was the third temptation of our blessed Lord, not to be concerned with the divine, but to be concerned only with the social and political order. Now come back to our Lord calling Peter Satan. The reason he did was because Satan tempted our Lord from the cross, and that is precisely what Peter was trying to do when he said to him, this shall not be. We will recognize your divinity, but will not recognize the cross. And from that time on to this, this is the biblical essence of the satanic. We have it, the spirit of it in the church. Notice how much we've given up mortification, self-denial, discipline in schools, in seminaries, the attempted disruption, books, for example, that will only describe the evil, real or imaginary, of people. And they are in some of our schools, as you well know. This is the disruptive element, the diabolic. But the decline of the spirit of discipline, 
is a hatred of the cross. The ascetic or the disciplinary character of Christianity has moved to the totalitarian states. It is in China. It is in Russia. There, there's discipline, self-denial, commitment to a common purpose, but without a cross and therefore with complete destruction of human liberty. How much will this diabolic and the satanic and contempt of the cross continue to manifest itself? Well, we do not know for sure that we are in the age of the demonic. But there's a passage in St. Paul which at first seems very difficult. May I read it to you and then I will explain it. It is in Second Theologians, chapter 2, verse 7. Now remember, Paul was writing this well within the first 60 years of Christianity. Already the secret power of wickedness is at work. Secret. Secret only for the present. In other words, we cannot see the manifestation of evil and the demonic. Secret only for the present until the restrainer disappears from the scene. We do not know precisely who is the restrainer. Maybe Christ, maybe the Holy Spirit, maybe an influx of grace, maybe the holiness of the church. But in any case, the evil is secret until God says, all right, now evil, you will have your day, your hour. God has his day, evil has his hour. And then continuing, and then he will be revealed, Satan, that wicked man whom the Lord Jesus will destroy with the breath of his mouth and annihilate by the radiance of his coming. But the coming of that wicked man is the work of Satan. It will be attended by powerful signs and miracles and lies and all deception that sinfulness can impose on those who are doomed to destruction. Even in the last book of scripture we get the hint that when the Antichrist comes there will be a simulated death and resurrection in order to deceive. So at present we cannot see the demonic at work. But let me give you a hint as to how Christ works and how Satan works. Now if you understand what I'm about to tell you, it will help you very much in dealing with the evil of the world and in overcoming it. I'm going to describe how our Lord appears before we sin and how Satan appears before we sin. Then I will describe how our Lord appears after we sin and how Satan appears after we sin. First of all, how does our Lord appear bef just before we sin, as when we are about to sin? Well, he appears as thou shalt not. He appears as the Lord on the cross. He bars the way. He says, my flesh was crucified, your flesh be crucified too. Go not this way. And so he stands in front of us. Oh, we're not free. We cannot do all we want to do. 
Christ is there. But how does Satan say or talk when we are about to sin? Oh, don't be sick. We don't believe those things anymore. Times have changed. Are you still a virgin? You mean you've never had a smoke of marijuana? Listen, everybody's doing it. Don't pay attention to those doctors who tell you that it'll hurt your brain cells. You've got to live. You have to be yourself. You haven't committed adultery? Everybody's doing it now. These views of strict morality were all right 100 years ago or 500 years ago. But this is a new world. I gotta be me, I gotta be free. That's the way the devil talks. He's on our side. Before we sin, Christ seems to be the accuser. Before we sin, the devil is our defender. He's on our side. The side of our sex, the side of our pride, the side of our greed. He takes our part. After we sin, then the roles are reversed. Then Christ becomes the defender and the devil the accuser. And the devil will say, all right, now you've had your dope. Now you're hooked. Don't come to me, I can't help you. You might just as well give up. Sure, you've lost your virginity. Now what difference does it make? You might just as well go on. Sure, you've stolen. You haven't been caught, but you will be, or you're about to be caught. And so the devil fills us with despair as he filled the heart of Judas with despair. Judas could have gone to the Savior, and the Savior would have forgiven him. But Judas took a rope and walked the frozen ground before the frosty trees, and every knot in every tree seemed to him like an eye. And every branch of every tree seemed to be an accusing finger. Traitor. There was nothing for him to do in his despair but suicide. And that is one of the reasons why suicide is on the increase in our civilization. Despair. The devil got us. In one of the novels of Dostoevsky, Raskolnikov, who was a very evil man, said to a girl whom he loved, he said, Sonia, do you know what's going to happen to you? You're either going to jump off a bridge or you're going mad or you will cut your throat. But that was not the way it happened. Because so you picked up the Gospel of John 
And she began reading the resurrection of Lazarus. And she said, I can find new life in Christ. Which brings me to the way that our Lord acts after the sin. Now he is our defender. He said, come to me. All ye who labor. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. And if they are as red as crimson, they shall be made white as wool. Poor, piteous, futile thing. Why should any set thee love apart? For how hast thou merited? Of all man's clotted clay, the dingiest clot. Alas, thou knowest not how little worthy of any love thou art. For whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee? Save me. Save only me. All that thy child's mistakes, fancies is lost, I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. This is the language of the Savior after we sin. Now I've told you what the diabolic is. The disruption of unity. The satanic, the contempt of the cross, mortification and self-denial. And therefore of Christ himself. There are 10,000 times 10,000 roads down which any of you may travel for a lifetime. And it makes no difference which road you travel. At the end of all of these roads, you are going to see two faces. Either the merciful face of Christ or the horrible face of Satan. And either one at the end of your life will say, Mine. Mine. Play not therefore with that which is evil. Otherwise, we are caught. And I will tell you the three powerful weapons against Satan. First, the holy name of Jesus. That is a name that Satan cannot stand. Because in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth. The second, the blood of Christ. The invocation of the blood of Christ. I may give you a sermon on that. But we are saved with the blood of Christ. And therefore in temptation, call upon his blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And thirdly, devotion to our Blessed Mother. For at the beginning, in the book of Genesis, it was the seed of a woman that would crush the seed of Satan. We are armed with three, these three weapons. The Holy Name, the blood of Christ, and the Blessed Mother. 
And when you think of the diabolic and the demonic and the satanic, do not be led off the track by what you may hear through the media of communications. The demonic very simply is the anti-cross. The anti-disciplined life. The anti-Christ. That's the satanic. Nothing else. You never go wrong if you understand that. And he bids you love that cross. Whenever there's silence round about me by day or night, I am startled by a cry. It came down from the cross the first time I heard it. And I went out and searched and found a man in the throes of crucifixion. And I said, I will take you down. And I tried to take the nails out of his feet. But he said, let them be. For I cannot be taken down until every man, woman, and child come together to take me down. But I said, what can I do? I cannot bear your cry. And he said, go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross. <laughs>